Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And this video is really focused on Ripple and XRP today because I came across three things that I had not seen before. The first one is a video that was uploaded on the 14th of this month. It took place at the Shift Money Conference in Croatia. And as you can see, I think it's gone under the radar because it had only 269 views thus far. And it had a lot of great information that came from the sales director at Ripple, Ross Darcy. And thanks to Helen Joyce, who interviewed him, she really knows her stuff. And boy, does it make a difference when the interviewer is asking good questions. She's the finance editor at The Economist. And I am so thankful that she knew what questions to ask to drill down and get some of the good stuff. So as Ross says, I'm going to just pull out some of the highlights here if you don't have time to listen to the entire interview in full, because there are some very interesting points. First, Ripple is beyond the point of concept or pilot uh, testing phases. They're not doing them anymore. And they've decided that if the pro potential client can't see the value, they are going to move on. And they are um, working on that value as they grow the network. And as it grows and as the customers are added one by one, um, we need to remember that uh, we saw a lot of new customers added this last year. And I don't think we were tired of them, but maybe sometimes we get to like, okay, okay, another customer, that's great, yeah, but what about the price? Well, it's very clear that the power in the numbers is going to make a huge difference. And the reason why is because um, Helen asked him, what is the magic number? In other words, what is the tipping point? for Ripple in regards to customers. And Ross replied that he sees the uh, whole network having an effect when they reach three or 400. So that's a very interesting number. That's why every customer that's added is important. And as that network grows, that is where we're going to start to see the value to have an impact on the price. I'm just sure of it. Uh, another takeaway was that they have added 12 banks in the Middle East. And I was not aware of that. From what I have researched, I can find three official announcements. But in this um, video at the nine minute, four second mark, he does, Ross does state that there are 12 banks that they have in the Middle East. And uh, Ripple is really able to provide value to the challenger banks. But in addition, they are also a complement product. So he says that they don't necessarily tell people to get rid of SWIFT, but they can take advantage of this changing environment. And the difference is, is that they can offer the solution for the high volume and low value payments as well. So he cites a customer, um, or an, he didn't say customer, he cites um, a business like Uber who can um, really benefit from the uh, technology by um, their particular business model, which has a lot of high volume but low value payments. So they really can provide um, not only the large banks, these um, powerful liquidity through XRP with the cross-border remittances, but also they are able to uh, be a complement product in this changing environment. Okay, and moving on, he said that it sometimes takes eight months to a year of conversation to get a customer live. So it's a very long sales cycle. And in regards to more of that ledger conversation, he talks about how when you have a uh, Ripple Bank A, for example, uh, that is dealing with Ripple Bank B, they bring that distributed 
ledger technology and the subledgers. So he's using the word subledgers. And that subledger from bank A and B then syncs to the ILP. So this is another way to look at the way the banks correspond with each other in sending those packet information of settlement through the interledger protocol. All right, so this is very simple. Three clicks, 30 seconds, and the beneficiary is paid. They don't have any failed payments with this technology, whereas SWIFT is experiencing 4 to 6% failure rate. And it's a huge savings for these banks because the manual process uh, that they take in terms of time to track those failures is a big cost. So you just have to realize that um, in that technology, it's not just the cost savings for the remittance, but also the cost savings in manual time. Okay, and he was then asked, what is the biggest competitor for SWIFT? And that is the status quo, he believes. It's not SWIFT, but the status quo. So it's a very, very good uh, 30 minutes, and I will put the link to the video in the comment section below. All right, and Hodor, well, he never disappoints. And this is the rise of digital assets in 2019. His blog came out today, the 21st of January, and it's a good one. Uh, it's quality. So don't miss this if you have not read it yet. And I learned in his blog that I really need to pay more attention to uh, Leonidas and his XRP Arcade website because this site was quite interesting. And he has an events calendar whereby I learned that David Schwartz is going to be talking at Harvard University in the Center of Mathematical Science and Applications along with R3 on the 24th of this month. And the interesting thing is, is that they are talking very close together. So um, you can see here in the afternoon from 2 to 2.50 p.m., David will be talking about the future of digital currency, building the internet of value, followed by Elisa DiCaprio, and she is with R3. And I hope the two of them have a dinner planned to talk about how to further work together. Okay, guys, have a very nice dinner and discuss that. All right, I am jumping into the fluff. So talking about schools, this kind of gave me an idea to talk and look at something that's a little bit unique uh, for Japan, and that is the use of uniforms, which I know they have them in Australia, New Zealand, the UK, and other places in Europe. But for the United States, I think the uniforms in the school, uh, uh, high schools and, and uh, elementary schools is a little bit different. And there is one part of the uniform that is very unique here to Japan. But first, I wanted to take a look. Here is an example in the turn of the century what women were wearing to school. So they actually were in kimono at the time, and the men were more in a very conservative, almost military-looking interview. And then, of course, they have modernized, and every school now on their website will show the winter version and summer version of uniforms and it's quite important I mean especially for the girls well probably for the guys too but the uniforms will sometimes be a big selling factor to whether or not those kids want to go to that school and one of the most popular uniforms for the girls at least the ones I talk to they love the sailor uniforms this is one of the most popular styles among the kids that are going to school. And this one is very typical. You'll see kids looking um, very 
sharp in their dark colored blazers and plaid wool skirts with their knee highs and penny loafers. And this school, I can tell, doesn't have real strict um, school policies because the girls have their hair down. Unless they have let it down after they got out of class, um, most of the schools in Japan require the girls to keep them uh, keep their hair in a ponytail or in pigtails. But if it's long, they have to pull it back. So I, I think uh, these girls are strutting a little bit of their stuff and look very confident and very stylish in their outfit. This is a very typical uh, is a very typical scene that you see in the afternoons here around the city. And the one part that is quite unique for Japan is the use of these bags. This is called a randoseru, and it is from the Dutch word ransel, which means backpack. And they are given to all Japanese kids at the age of six, and most of them use them uh, into um, 12, 13 years old. And they just get one, hopefully, <laughs> as long as it's not lost or stolen, because they're very, very expensive. They're made of leather, and they cost anywhere from 300 to $600. Uh, most of the very uh, big brands have 150 pieces to them. They take one year in the process to make them and sewn by skilled labor. And originally they came just in black or red, but thanks to Nagoya, who started this trend first, they have now come out in more than 60 color combinations. And this, I just wanted to end the video with, this is the typical street scene in the week all over Tokyo and all over Japan and this is what you see and it's so cute so the hats holding the hands and wearing their backpacks I guarantee you you come to Japan and about two or three o'clock in the afternoon on any street in Tokyo you will see this all right everybody that's all I have for you today Please take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.